Bible's open to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. Okay, so we're continuing in our series in 1 Timothy. So 1 Timothy 4. First Timothy 4, uh, starting verse 1, it says, Now the spirit, spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to the seducing doc, the spirits and doctrines of devils, uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. And uh, for every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Uh, so, just to kind of quickly review, we've had uh, Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, and he initially was writing to him, if we go back to chapter 1, uh, that he should teach that some teach no other doctrine. In other words, that there was going to be people where he was at in Ephesus that were teaching doctrine contrary to what Apostle Paul had given them, uh, contrary to what the Lord Jesus had taught, contrary to what the Word of God plainly had been teaching. And um, so he was charged with teaching those or commanding those that were doing that, hey, don't teach any other different doctrine. Uh, verse chapter 2. In chapter 3, we see that he elaborates on what some of that doctrine would be. And then he also establishes as far as criteria that the Lord Jesus had given him, uh, the Spirit of God as well, uh, with regard to what a faithful minister, a godly minister would be. And now in chapter 4, he's going ahead and he's going to uh, give a warning, uh, we see, of apostasy, warning of apostasy. Uh, first thing, uh, verse 1 uh, Spirit speak will expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Okay? Um, a lot of times there's argument with the fact is who is an apostate or what does that even mean? Uh, what, what does it qualify? But it, the, the idea here is that you have individuals that are in the faith that turn from it. It actually goes with uh, the same warning that Paul gave to the elders at Ephesus, actually at Miletus, to so the elders of Ephesus, while at Miletus, that he said, some of you are going to, you know, not just the ravening wolves that are going to come from without the congregation, but there's going to be some of you that are going to turn, and then you're going to seek to have people follow you, and you're going to be teaching, you know, falsehood and lies. And so you have to take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. That's a, that's another thing that you see. He's going to be reiterating here in this chapter and then throughout the book overall. Uh, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So, uh, warning about apostasy: there will be believers who turn from truth. There will be believers who turn from truth. Uh, it seems kind of weird that you would have people that are, you know, saved by the grace of God, blood bought, uh, and know God's goodness, have their whole, His Holy Spirit in them that they would turn to lies, that they would turn to falsehood, but it happens. Uh, uh, sir? just wanted to point out in this text, there is nothing that says that these people are believers. It says they turn from the truth. It doesn't say they're believers. And we need, need to be careful of that because it, with, if they're believers, it would seem that they're losing their salvation. Uh, they would, well, they, they're, either, they're either believers that 
that get deceived and teach false doctrines or they're unbelievers. But uh, it doesn't. The scripture here doesn't say that they're believers. It says some shall depart from the faith. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they were believers. It doesn't say that. So we need to be careful with the words. In your notes, you said believers. I did. Yeah. Okay. Because the implication is that they're within the faith and they walk away from it. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be in the faith if you weren't a believer. Well, it could be. You could be in the church and, and be a believer. It could be false false prophets coming to the church. But we need to be careful to say, about saying things that the Scripture doesn't say because it does not say they're believers there. It doesn't expressly state it. That right. would be the implication. That was the doctrine that led me to Christ. I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. I didn't mean to be contentious. No, that's fine. That's understandable. Uh, it's possible for a person that is a believer, though, to walk away from truth. Yes, that's but it's not. It can't, doesn't mean they've lost their salvation either. But. No, that, I wasn't implying that. Yeah. Okay. The, my my statement here is that there's going to be people that are in truth and they walk away from it. There's going to be people that turn away from truth. Because that, that's what he said. He said there's going to be people that will be in truth and they turn from it. And the, re the reason why he actually gives the reason is that because they uh, give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in other words, because they themselves decided to give heed, or in other words, they, they gave more credence to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, to false teaching, rather than remaining in proper doctrine, sound doctrine, okay. their influence to walk away. That's that, that's the only. Uh, well, yeah, that's the only. There, there's going to be people that are going to turn, and then the, their the influence for them turning from truth is uh, the fact that they're influenced by demonic teaching. Sorry if I worded that wrong as far as the implication there. It's not to say that believers lose their salvation. Nobody, nobody, that's not possible. It's simply that you'll have people um, because they say, well, they listen to such and such whatever teaching rather than giving more attention to scripture. I have, I have an example of that. There's a a lady at the pool that has a following, she has several other, uh, mostly younger men that she, she's been having kind of Bible studies with there. And I got talking to her and she found out she doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the creator. And you know, that just floored me because it's somebody that, that sounds like a mature Christian and yet has a belief that's that far off from the gospel. Yeah. You don't know her. So somebody you know personally? Uh, somebody I've met, yeah. Okay, so you have individuals that turn from truth uh, because they give credence to lies. They turn from truth, they give credence to lies, and as a result, uh, now some of how that's manifest is they speak lies and hypocrisy, and then they have a conscience that's seared with a hot iron. Um, the implication there is they oppose truth, and then a conscience that's trained to uh, excuse error. Uh, Romans chapter 2 that expresses that as far as the fact that you have individuals, not just in Romans 1 but in Romans 2 and 3 that whereas your conscience uh, either excuses or accuses you and the reason why is because uh, your conscience is trained or sensitized in your upbringing but it's, it's God given it's innate to you, it's, everyone's created with one 
as you know, where you have that intimate knowledge as far as what's explained in Romans 1, that even the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, even his eternal power from Godhead uh, are clearly understood because he's made it manifest in them and he showed it unto them. So in other words, God's made himself known to every human. Uh, now their response to that light or to that knowledge is what determines whether they get more light or whether they remain in darkness. And so an individual, here's uh, you can kind of differentiate or distinguish somebody that is in error. Uh, their conscience basically is going to refuse to acknowledge truth. They've uh, trained it to acknowledge error and accept error and reject truth. And they, they oppose truth. Uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy. So it's another thing as well. Uh, as far as example of apostasy, uh, they promote asceticism. All right, it's just a fancy term that says you're denying the flesh. So here they forbid to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Now this isn't the only way. Uh, most people uh, take a different route, and that is that they promote hedonism. They promote you know live according to the flesh, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. You know, you have nothing better than to enjoy what you have in this life. There's no tomorrow, so live it up and party. Um, but these in particular, uh, they teach forbidding to marry and then commanding to abstain from meats, uh, which we're clearly told here, God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Uh, further explanation for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refuted nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving uh, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So the food which we eat um, I would say there's common sense with regard to obviously your diet having a balanced diet um, but God created food. God created the animals that we eat, we've been given free reign to be able to go ahead and eat them, uh, the plants that we eat, uh, the fruit that we would eat, and such. Uh, and then these individuals that turn from truth, they uh, promote, okay, you forbid from eating this type of meat, that type of meat, uh, eating this type of fruit, that type of fruit, this type of vegetable, that type of vegetable. In other words, they restrict uh, as well as forbidding to marry. Now the idea there would be that it brings about some sort of closeness to God or some form of spirituality. Um, this is in an opposition to God. In other words, it's not something that I can freely enjoy, but rather something that I'm supposed to observe. Um, but the ultimate end or the ultimate mentality behind it is that it's a flaunt against you know, God's goodness to us. Uh, you know, rejecting God's goodness to us. It's basically trying to flaunt self-righteousness. Okay, so vaccine. How do you vaccinate against apostasy? In other words, how do you insulate yourself? How do you protect yourself from apostasy? We're told here the words of good faith and doctrine. Um, Verse 5, or excuse me, verse 6. Uh, if thou put the brethren in the remembrance of these things. Now these things are what he's just referred to, another what he just mentioned. That you have individuals that are going to depart from the faith, that are going to give heed to seducing spirits. Uh, obviously previous chapters as well, but immediate. And then also the fact that God has given every creature its good, uh, nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving and prayer, or is, because it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Um, and uh, good doctrine as opposed to bad doctrine. But if thou put uh, the brethren in remembrance of these things, uh, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, uh, whereunto thou hast attained. So he establishes words of faith and then words of good doctrine, or sound teaching, holy teaching, um, healthy teaching. 
that's what's going to insulate you. That's a foundation uh, for your insulation against uh, apostasy from being able to turn away. And then here, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Okay, a mindset to actively choose to reject error and accept truth. Um, I know this goes without saying this kind of silly question, but what is verse 7? What is verse 7? It's a command that Paul is telling Timothy. Refuse old wise fables and uh, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So in other words, he's telling him, reject error, adhere to truth, seek truth. The reason why that's important is uh, the fact is our growth, uh, our shielding ourselves from error, our, uh, you know, our ability to be able to stand and withstand in the day of temptation, in the day of evil, that comes about by me actively choosing. I have a free will that God expects me to exercise, and I need to go ahead and actively choose to say, hey, yes, I'm going to follow God. Yes, I'm going to be obedient. Yes, I'm going to submit. Yes, I'm going to seek his power. Yes, I'm going to armor up with the armor of God. Yes, I am, and so on and so forth, according to God's commands. Uh, this is supernatural endeavor. Uh, I, in my own strength, don't really have the ability, the strength, the wisdom, uh, and the things necessary. I need God for this, and so I need to actively seek to avoid error and then accept truth. Uh, actively pursue Christ's likeness. He mentions here as well is that uh, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life there is, and that which is to come. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. In other words, um, focus on the eternal rather than on the temporal. And that's really pursuing Christ likeness. Uh, I am <laughs> I'm not gonna get anywhere as far as there is benefit, obviously, is uh, physical exercise. He's not saying that you don't physically exercise. Uh, the contrast there is that you focus on the eternal rather than the temporal. Uh, though the temporal, there is benefit to it, uh, the eternal has far, far-reaching uh, benefit as compared to the temporal. And uh, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Follow the example of a good servant, and then seek to be an example. Seek to be, I misspelled that. Huh. Seek to be an example of a good servant is what it should be, not and. Um, skip down to verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Uh, Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Uh, verse 15. Uh, meditate, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Um, verse 12. Okay, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and in, in conversation, in charity and spirit, in faith, in purity. Three different verses where there's commands that are given to Timothy in particular, and he's told roughly the same thing, and that is give heed to this, and here's the reason why. Basically, there's people watching you, and there's people that are going to listen to you, there's people that are going to follow you, uh, follow your example. Now, we don't follow men, we follow God, we worship God, um, but we have, you know, men as examples or as object lessons from which to learn. And the fact is, uh, 
you know, the good examples, even honestly from the bad examples. I'm not saying that you follow bad doctrine, bad teaching, or even bad behavior, but I'm saying you can learn from somebody that walks in error what not to do. You see somebody a shipwreck, uh, obviously you pray for them, you reach out to them, but you learn from them and say, this is what I need to avoid. Uh, but nevertheless, you, um, we don't know all, so a lot of times we seek example as far as whom to follow, what to follow. And a lot of times, most people's life or testimony serve as an object lesson to assist us in drawing closer to the Lord and walking, um, walking more uprightly. Uh, and the same thing here, uh, seek to be an example. Uh, not just follow a good example, but seek to be an example. There are going to be people you may not be aware of it, and you don't know to what degree an influence you have in other people's lives, but there are people that are looking for uh, somebody or looking for examples, real life object lesson that they can fixate on, that they can sit on, that they can use to draw them, you know, to draw closer to the Lord. Uh, and if, if we're not consistent in our walk, then what we do is we end up giving a blurred image, a marred image to people of what the, the God of heaven is like, uh, what the Lord Jesus is like. That's really what our call is, is we're ambassadors. Uh, you know, we serve the living God, the invisible God, uh, but we know he's real. Uh, he lives in our hearts, uh, and he's made alive through the spirit of God in reading his word. And the fact is, is that if we're not seeking to be consistent in our lifestyle and seeking to be consistent uh, in, in our example, we hinder a lot of the work that he's trying to do through us, uh, not just in us, but through us. Okay, uh, recourses for sound doctrine, or recourses for apostasy, recourses for apostasy. And that basically comes down to sound teaching and holy living, sound teaching and holy living. Um, now, holy living is only made possible really by sound teaching, and holy living really is founded upon sound teaching. So ultimately, it comes down to sound teaching. And we see this towards the end of the chapter where um, we can't do that in the flesh. No, it requires yeah. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, Galatians, fine. You know, um, we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, walk in the, walk spirit. In the Spirit, and you shut off the flesh of the flesh. Yeah, this isn't, it's impossible in our own strength. You would, what I believe is possible is that you can perform the activity without the heart behind it, but it obviously wouldn't be empowered by God. Uh, you wouldn't have God's blessing on it, and you end up giving a marred image. That's where you have a lot of uh, error come in as far as one or the other, of asceticism and, and a, a lot of what we see in the, in the modern day uh, evangelical churches, uh, individuals that try to imitate power of God in the flesh. Uh, so they try and manufacture God's working through emotion or atmosphere and, and these other kinds of things. And, and that's as a result of the fact that they're relying on their own strength rather than God's ability to be able to do that. And when you've tasted truth, when you're acquainted with truth, then you're gonna you're gonna be able to know and recognize uh, true, you know, true holy living God's power. God's enabling, uh, you know, the Spirit of God giving grace to be able to go ahead and uh, do His will to be well pleasing. Uh, that peace that path of the all understanding and such as what is described uh, in the Scriptures. Uh, but Timothy is told here, um, "Let no man despise thy youth, but be an example." Uh, Nick, well. Meditate upon these things, give thyself fully to them, that thy profiting may appear to all, and then take heed to thyself and to the doctrine. Uh, for in doing so, 
For in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Now, it's an interesting verse. What are you, what's he saving? Who's he saving? Verse 16. saving them from? Error. Yeah, basically. Yeah. You, you rescue people. You act as a first responder, if you will, for people going into apostasy or into error uh, and giving heed to sound doctrine and to thyself. Obviously, it starts with your own life as far as if you, when you find error in your own life, hey, I need to repent of it, and then I need to adopt God's view, and I need to adopt God's way, and then from that also, I'll obviously propagate it, and uh, here's another thing as far as he gives in verse 15 is meditation, meditating, meditating on these things, meditating on scripture, meditating on the word of God, meditating on uh, not just the outcome of that, but the profit or the benefit that you get from it is going to affect other people as well because uh, it's going to come out in your life it's going to bleed out if you will and so you have an opportunity we have an opportunity to be able to go ahead and rescue people from a life of destruction uh, with regard to false teaching uh, with regard to wasted life with regard to even eternity for that matter. Jesus does the saving of the soul. You know, and really ultimately it's a work of the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit in a person's life with regard to where they go or where they're at to where God wants to take them. Uh, and, but we're the vehicle that God wants to use. Uh, his Spirit, His Word, and then uh, us, the humans that are born again. To be able to communicate that truth. Uh, now we might be heavily involved, or we might be minimally involved, uh, but nevertheless he uses, he does use us to be able to go ahead and communicate truth to individuals. So we need to be ever so cautious that one, we ourselves are in sound doctrine, uh, that we're benefiting from it, uh, meditating on it, and then also seeking to be consistent in living out the truth that we learn. Uh, that God, the Holy Spirit, teaches us so that we can be effective as a sound minister, as a good minister. Uh, there's people that are going to turn. Uh, and that's always disheartening when you have individuals that you would look up to and then they, they turn. You know, they, they have a moral failure or in some other, in some other area of life where it seems like Hey, they were steady, steadfast for a good part of their life, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, what happened? But um, don't fret. The fact is, Jesus is still on the throne. Uh, we don't have to go down that path that way. <laughs> it is possible for a person to be able to go ahead and stand before God and hear, well done, God, good and faithful servant. It is possible, even if nobody else is going to be standing with you, even if it seems like the whole world turns turns against you um, but we can and it is possible for us to be able to go ahead and be uh, pleasing to the Lord and to be able to uh, be ones that are faithful to the end if you will be able to be faithful till Jesus returns or till we'll take him home anybody have any questions? questions?